progress. Right, Najib, how are you? Milton, Shiguro? You're muted, Najib. Oh, uh, hi, thank you for accepting our uh, invitation. Yeah. Ah, pleasure. Thank you. The topic, your topic is interesting. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think more people should be, uh, uh, should should care about this kind of things, you know, what relate to ethics and responsibilities and yeah. the ethic of responsibility. And it's it's in, it's been very interesting watching how people have been, in a sense, misusing visualization uh, over the last uh, year or two in this whole happy game of um, large language models, diffusion models, and so on. But more of that when I get to it in the slides. Let me just switch on this light and see if that's better. Yes, please. Responsibility is also the very big topic this related to this area. Yeah. I, it's interesting because when, when we created our MSc in Big Data Analytics about eight years, eight or nine years ago, our program was the first program to have a dedicated mo uh, module for ethics, trust, and governance. Which is I've had an interest in for Let's a long start. time. Are we ready to start, uh, Najib? Uh, oh yes, please. Okay, right. Let me just share this so you can all see it. Oh, which one? Oh, we'll go for that one. Yeah. Can you all see the slides or not? No, not yet. No. Not yet. Not yet. I think it's gone away. Uh, um, screen two I'll go for. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now we got it. That looks it. Looks like it. Okay. Yeah. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, this morning to uh, what I hope you'll find is an interesting look at the question about, about the ethics and responsibilities as we look at data analysis, look at visualization, and we look at the question of storytelling. Because of course, all of the big data analytics and so on that we do that feeds into all across all of the disciplines that are represented here, storytelling is connecting insights, facts in a way that associates both with the intellect and with the emotion. We have, all of us, I'm sure, have watched over the years the fact that politicians, various different sort of politicians, some, of who are, some are incredibly connected to facts and logic. And we notice that they tend not to be as effective in swaying opinions as those who use logic, but also use emotions. And this is why we talk about storytelling. And we have, particularly in the modern world, the last two years, with the rise of large language models, with over the last 20 years, the rise of big data analytics, where everything, and even in business, everything is aimed at, can we trust our data? Everything is aimed at data. Not our experience, but data. And since 2000 or so, we've had more and more technologies, statistically based technologies, to analyze all of the big data. We've, we've moved away from 
you thinking about causal models and the data scientists data artists tend now just to say well we've got all the data let's find out the correlations in that data without worrying about causality until something maybe turns up and of course most of us aren't terribly good at understanding p values and t values and chi values and all the other values that come out of the statistics and so we like to have visualizations because visualizations now we say a picture is worth a thousand words or ten thousand words and so one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is when we see visualizations graphs and so on and we trust them and as we've been looking at the growth, particularly of AI and particularly of large language models, uh, the diffusion models that create images and uh, videos and audio, what are we hearing in terms of the story from the marketeers, from the developers? Can we trust their storytelling? And as we look at all of the people who are out there in the professional websites, the academic websites, and in the social media like LinkedIn. What angle or whose angle is actually being sort of promulgated? We know we have a problem with veracity. There's so much data there. This is a chart from 12 years ago from John Easton from IBM. And he pointed out, even back then, of all of the data around us, probably 80% is of uncertain veracity. So we can't actually necessarily trust the data until we actually investigate it very, very, very carefully. We used to think that GPS and, you know, the sort of location tagging of photos and so on, on these gadgets are smartphones with GPS location on it. But it turns out, and this is, you can see 10 years ago, this company called Think Near did some analysis over a period of a year or so, looking at the difference between the reported site where, or reported location of where uh, ad location-based advertising was being targeted and where the um, devices actually were. And you can see, even out to 100 kilometers, we had five, 10% of inaccurate locations at 100 kilometers, 70 miles, for those who are closer to the imperial system. That's kind of interesting. It has interesting consequences of uh, reputation if you don't realize you've got these sorts of errors. I picked up on this again in around about tw uh, 2012. And this was the journey that my little uh, GPS tracker logger um, carried out over a period of 24 hours based in my conservatory, taking a reading every five, five seconds or so. And as you can see, the location varied by plus or minus 30 meters in quite good visibility. Can we trust that data? Not very well. Now, as we move on through this, we now begin to get some more interesting things about formal presentation of numbers, formal uh, use of visualization. And this one caused a lot of upset a few years ago in the UK, just after we've had some really, really bad winter floods. And the UK Treasury wanted to try and get out from under the accusation that they'd not been funding flood defences. And so they presented the left-hand picture. But they used a logarithmic y-axis so that the Flood defences looked as though it's quite a reasonable proportion in relation to the big investments. Sir Andrew Dilnot, uh, who was the sort of government's 
cheese statistician gatekeeper pointed out something slightly different. And I'll show you the a little bit later on, I'll actually be doing the same sort of thing with one or two of the LLM type data. Now, you can see it more clearly here. These were specifically chosen to try and put all of the different areas of investigation or investment, sorry, into a similar sort of scaling. It's only when you look carefully at the y-axis, you see you've got 1 billion, then 10 billion, then 100 billion. And you suddenly realize this little one, this one for the flood is actually very, very, very insignificant, which is what Andrew Dilnot actually then showed when he forced the treasury to republish, and it looked like that, using a linear axis rather than a logarithmic axis. Because humans aren't very good at understanding the consequences of logarithmic axes. And you can hide a lot of sins, you can make a lot of spin out of using logarithmic axes. Here's another, and this is a quite a recent one as well, from a couple of months ago. Comparing, and it was a, used as part of a almost clickbait-like heading for an article. And Forbes used this, and they didn't really kind of clean up. In fact, the published chart on the left was part of the clickbait. To show to actually sort of compare, hey, these guys don't know what they're talking about. Why is customer experience going one way and customer satisfaction diving the opposite way so dramatically? This is one of the more egregious forms of visualization ethics. One scale here i'm both admittedly both are linear scales yeah that's okay so they haven't fallen into the log scale problem but look if you look at this end on the forester index at 70.5 on the left there across here on the acsi index at 76 so they shifted the axes out of synchronization and of course they've also met done the really egregious problem of um, false origin 71 on the right hand side, 67.5 on the left hand side. So you can't actually compare it very easily. Put it to um, a true origin zero at the bottom and full scale on the left for both of them. And you see that there's not a lot, it's not. Not like going up and down the hill, the mountains of Everest. It's kind of a gentle slope. Okay, turn it false origin. And you can see that historically, they work in opposition to each other. The point here, of course, is by choosing the scale here in the left-hand one, two different x uh, y scales left and right and we see this quite often actually because they want to make a specific point they don't want the point challenged until you kind of look at it like this and think actually that blue line over on the left hand side is actually really quite gentle quite smooth Now, when we started getting into the game of large language models, we started getting all sorts of charts. And because it was nice and convenient, because these, the, if you look along the left-hand uh, one, the, they've got a sort of, sort of log scale along here. And what they're trying to show us are all the different variations in the large language models in terms of parameter, number of parameters. Because these were different types, different named LLMs from 0.1 billion all the way up to GPT-3 at 175 billion. And showing some picture of accuracy growing 
in a relatively smooth uh, on the blue, on the green, and a bit more uh, sort of erratically on a few shot uh, examples. And what, and the message that they're trying to portray here is that it's still going up. It kind of looks like it's peaked, uh, plateaued, plateauing a bit, but it's still going up. And they did the same with a different uh, accuracy parameter. And this was all part of Sam Altman's um, idea to get $7 trillion funding to, as he put it, rescue AI. He wanted $7 trillion worth of investment to meet his dream of artificial general intelligence based on large language models. Sorry. Now, if we take this left-hand picture and replot it on a linear rather than logarith logarithmic x-axis, we see something rather different. That's the, the logarithmic scale in these are orders of magnitude grow. Uh, yeah, powers of 10. So that's one billion and then you go to the next one up and the next one up and so on this looks though it's a sort of continuously growing increasing kind of curve it's sort of kind of tipping over a bit put it onto a true linear scale and you see that it's all the improvement is in those first few points, up to around about, what's that? Less than 10 billion, around about 10, 11, 12 billion there. And then uh, thereafter, just by going up two orders of magnitude, a hundred times in of size, to the from eight just under 15 billion parameters to 175 billion parameters there's almost no improvement it gets worse if you go back to oh let's think it'll be about two years ago or, or thereabouts there was a huge amount of excitement about emergent properties. And the idea that was being presented was that if you just get a bit more compute into the um, training, a bit more compute into the inferencing, a bit more data into the training and so on, hey, we're gonna get reasoning machine. And they looked at this, and they presented in their paper and the, archi the archive uh, version is there. You will see that they presented it with a log scale across the bottom, because what they were looking at is from 10 to the 20th to 10 to the 22nd um, number of floating point operations. Nothing much was happening. And then suddenly it took off, shot up. And they could do this with all sorts of different uh, accuracy type parameter uh, measures of the um, success of using large language models. And they claimed that this showed if we, as long as we can get above 10 to 20 second ish flops, we get these capabilities. And we don't know what else might be happening when we get to 10 to the 24th, 10 to the 26th training flops. But it's all fantastic. It'll get us to auto, uh, the artificial general intelligence that these guys believe in and want to get to. What is interesting? is when you take that logarithmic scale and turn it into a linear x-axis. And the right-hand picture shows just how staggeringly false the left-hand picture is. What it shows is that all of the improvement happened right at the very early days. The 18 billion odd 
um, flops one, or whatever it is. <clears throat> Sorry, not this is not uh, parameters, this is flops here. You've got almost all of the benefit by the time you get to that 15% blur. Go above 10 to the 23, 5 times 10 to the 23. And yeah, you've gone up a bit. And I've actually done a little extension up to 10 to 26 on the assumption that that left hand picture is linear, uh, it carries on linearly. And you discover that the plateauing is incredible. And so rather than having emergent properties, what we're really seeing when you think about it is that it's showing there's a bare minimum of something, in this case flops, before anything happens. It's a bit like taking um, a big battle tank, whether it's an Abrams or a Chieftain or whatever, <clears throat> and you're not quite sure how, how to estimate the power that you need in the, the motor. So you try a, a motorbike engine and nothing happens. That's down far to the left. And as you slowly increase the size of the engine, eventually, when you get to a few thousand horsepower, the tank starts moving. And as you increase it, it goes faster and faster. But does it mean that something new is going to happen when you get to 10,000 or 100,000 horsepower? Probably not. So left hand, AGI believers, emergence, and we'll get more emergence, reasoning and so on as we get to ever higher amounts of training, floating point operations. Reality? For the skeptics, the skeptics are the ones who say, prove it, remember. We're looking at a plateau. So it was a, it's my kind of reflection on this is it's unethical and fraudulent to use log scales to do, to do that demonstration. It was used to support their wished for result. And we've watched now for 12 months plus. And the large language models, however much they pour extra power into them, actually hardly improved at all. Look at this. This is, this is an open AI graph. And what we get, other than the math one, which shows a reasonable improvement from GPT 4T to 4.0 and from 4, the orange one, decent improvements there, mostly. A, they're all at the same level. B, tiny little improvements. So 4.0, <clears throat> which is the latest, latest, latest Super Wizzo, in most respects is hardly any better than 4T, which is hardly any better in many areas than for the ordinary GPT-4. And on occasion, we're seeing, uh, if we look at the disc discrete reasoning over paragraphs, the last block, <clears throat> the newest GPT-4.0 is actually worse by quite a bit than the previous one, 4T. Kind of interesting. You wonder almost why they showed it. And they did show it. And it, it is showing a plateauing in many respects. Not all respects, the math one, it is getting better. They're building more technologies in there um, that help with doing the math. Maybe it's because in 4T and 4O, they built in some of the Wolfram uh, statistics or Mathematica system. Who knows? The last thing I want to look at, and this is really something that is applicable to all of us across all of our disciplines. It's about not being captured by our hypothesis when we're doing research. It's a very interesting one that came out, came out in, oh, it was early July, just before I, kind of used a version of this presentation at an AI summit in London. 
the purpose of this was to show that if you, well, we, we know that if you take an LLM, train it on some data, create some more data, particularly computer generated data, but it can even be ordinary human generated data and add to the training material and do it again and again. But particularly if you use the output of LLMs to train, to add to the training, then you get what's called model collapse. You lose accuracy, basically. And they wanted, the researchers here wanted to prove that if you did the same sort of thing, you produce two new lots of data, but rather than adding to the previous training, you then fully retrained the model. They wanted to see what happened. And as we could have predicted from stuff that had happened long before, people this piece of research has done they showed that by retraining from scratch you basically stay with kind of no loss of accuracy and so they then presented some of these sort of graphs and and so they're showing how the model uh, iterations and this is where they were cumulatively adding to the training or they call it replaces. What they mean by that is that the new stuff they're loading in kind of as part of the model collapse kind of uh, overlays some of the original learning. With their new one, which was create some stuff, add it to the old training material and retrain. Look, aren't we great? It all happens and we don't lose anything. And so what they were looking at is this, the, the figure title tells you something very important, what they were actually hypothesizing and what they felt they'd proven. The problem was that they were so locked in to their hypothesis that's there, they forgot the bigger story. The bigger story is that Everybody who's producing large language models is looking for more and more and more and more and more uh, text to feed into them. They've used all that they can get. Now they need 10 times, 100 times as much data, as much text. This is showing that as you go twice, three times, four times, five times as much data, nothing much happens in terms of the accuracy or the quality of the machine. Extrapolated a little bit further along, 10 times, 100 times, it's not going to make any difference to the capabilities, or not significant anyway. And this is a lesson for across all of the stuff that we do, across all of the disciplines we're involved with, is yes, make your hypotheses, to prove or disprove. But don't forget that there may well be other very, very interesting, important hypotheses that you've forgotten or ideas that are part of the broader picture. They forgot the context that they were working in. So what I want to finish with is the question, a few little thoughts. Beware the storyteller. The storyteller has an aim. The storyteller has a perspective that they want to influence. In terms of visualization, yeah, be careful about whether you're getting linear or logarithmic scales. Are they all nicely meshing or are they all sorts of variations? Beware of proving a specific objective. Most of our research ought to be an honest, open investigation of what's happening. Even when we're recreating somebody else's research, this is part of the process of science and, uh, and research and repeating uh, experiments, we still need to remember that we aren't trying to prove something necessarily, we're trying to investigate something. We need to think about the biases in the story, the biases 
in the uh, the storyteller. Oops, we're nearly running out. Um, where's my picky got to? Uh, sorry, if it, I can't get it back again. But we need to be thinking about who is saying what. So I will stop there. Are there any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Because I think it's going to cancel it or close us down quite shortly. Yeah, your last observation is really a, a, a great one. It's evident, but I never saw it. That research is always about uh, uh, an objective, explicit or implicit objective. So this might bias the investigation process, the research process, because you got an objective, because human beings are teleological beings with objective and purposes. So it is evident, but I never saw it. That your human nature of being a teleological animal is what make you being biased in, without noticing it. So you can imagine if you are doing that on purpose. Yes. yes. I thought I that this kind of, I thought that these kind of things are happening just in politics, but it seems not to be happening just in politics, but in a in the marketing of any product. Particularly large language models. And before we finish, I'd like to add one other point. We talk a lot about generative AI at the moment. The interesting thing is that we need to be much more specific because what we call Gen AI is actually a composite of half a dozen or more technologies. We've got la large language models, we've got diffusion models for image generation, but then we have a whole load of other types of generative uh, data manipulation systems, things like um, uh, generative um, the GANs and the variation encoders, the and and which do which sometimes actually work, whereas we're seeing with language models, with um, diffusion models um, for images and videos, they're very very uncontrollable. They're very very unreliable. Whereas variation encoders can be very useful for certain types of numeric data, and so we need to get much much more careful about how we talk about the dozens and dozens and dozens of technologies within AI. They all have their strengths and weaknesses and capabilities. And yet, you know, we talk about AI, is it safe? Is it, you know, is it good? Well, it's like asking about transportation or asking about drugs. Well, paracetamol and Tylenol, they're great. And they're safe, mostly. Morphine, heroin, kind of not so um and so you have to be precise about which drug you're talking transportation are you talking about wind powered um large wind powered uh, boats to cargo boats are you talking about those electric scooters that zip around on the pavements and mow us all down in the west which technology so it's the same goes with ai this whole thing called AI, it's a meaningless term. Completely meaningless until you get specific. Do you mean large language model? Do you mean predictive analytics and so on? I think we're going to be canceled out by the system very, very shortly. So um, let's see how long we've been. Yeah, we're coming Great to cancel. the end. So I would like to much. appreciate. I, 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 we are grateful for your presentation. It's uh, it's something that uh, seems evident after you say it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is this this is something that should be known everywhere, especially in the scientific world mm. and the technological world, of course, because it's related to marketing and all that. So. Uh, Thank you, really. Thank you so much for 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 your presentation. A pleasure. Uh, uh,
Yeah, thank, thank you. you Goodbye, everybody.